The, um, the Franklin family is synonymous with early island aviation. And tonight's program is the story of the role of the Franklin family and the role it played in moving aviation forward as, as a very important part of our community. Generally, most people know of or have heard of Roy Franklin. And of course, he was one of our first, if not the first, honoree of the, of the honor wall. And of course, uh, there's many pictures of Roy at, at Ernie's. Um, but there is an entire Franklin family behind the legend and the story, and that's what we'll be sharing here tonight. And uh, the Franklin family is over at the table. Uh, Steve, do you want to introduce the uh, family? We have here uh, Susie, my sister. Uh, my brother Ken, he's not here. Janet is not here either. She's on, and Nancy lives on the mainland. But we have my son, uh, Mark, next. Uh, his f friend, and then a friend of mine, Beth, and Jamin. And Jamin's a twin of Mark. <laughs> and we have Bob and Susie. So those are the, those are who we have. Um, thanks to Bob Jarman, we were able to uh, get a yes. We had, uh, over the years, many, many no's and hell no's and heck no's and different versions of no's. And uh, they basically ran out of excuses. So at a rotary breakfast one morning, when Bob had a, had a second cup of coffee, I says, we really are counting on you. You promised me several years ago you'd do this. And he didn't respond no quickly. So I said, okay, we're in. So he went home and talked to Susie and Susie talked to Talk to, talk to Steve, and uh, we made it happen. So uh, before Steve gives his presentation, uh, uh, as you probably know, Roy many years ago drafted a poem about why you need an airport, and I think it kind of sets the stage in the in the flavor of the Franklin family and what early aviation is. That we enjoy a beautiful runway and great facilities, but what Roy brought to the island and he created for us. It's good to stop and remember. So, Bob, if you'll take the mic and read us Roy's poem, please. Thanks, Bob. Uh, just to, we were sitting over there at the table talking about the, which direction we were going to go forward. And as always, they'd always say, give it to the brother-in-law. And uh, it, <laughs> that turned out to be me. And then... Uh, I'd had uh, Jamin, he is the oldest of the, uh, of the two twins, and the only reason he's the oldest of the two twins is that uh, they were born cesarean and they reached in and pulled him out first, according to Mark. <laughs> but uh, Jamin worked for me for a while, and uh, I told Jamin, I said, you gotta get involved in the community and this and that and everything. And uh, he, he said that he would, and then when the phones would ring, they'd always say, you don't need to come, Bob. Can you send the other one out? He's a lot better looking. <laughs> so with that being said, I'm going to introduce Jamin, and he is going to read the poem. <laughs> OK, who said he is better looking? <laughs> So, Jamin, take it away. All right. There's a little mic right there, too. So I got to hold both of them? Yeah. Okay. I'll stand right by in case you make a mistake. <laughs> You're not my boss anymore, Bob. You yeah. never know. <laughs> Do you need help with that? <laughs> there we go. Well, maybe we'll see. There we go. All right. Um, my grandpa. Hold the microphone. Okay. <laughs> My, uh, my grandpa, Roy Franklin, um, wrote this, and it is titled, Why Build an Airport? If you have ever tried to beat off frozen snow from an airplane while a doctor is waiting, trying to keep someone alive, you don't have to be a genius to know the first building you better build is an aircraft hangar. If you have ever had your heart slamming against your ribcage while you feel your way down at 70 miles per hour onto a black and unlighted cow pasture, there will be no doubt as to the value of runway lights. If you have ever worked all night on a sick engine with your frozen fingers and lockjaw from holding a flashlight in your mouth, 
you will automatically be making plans for a lighted and heated aircraft maintenance building. If you have ever started out the first flight of the day with fuel gauges bobbing on empty and the closest fuel miles away across the water on the mainland, you know you will mortgage your soul for a local fueling facility. And if you have, if you have ever tried to the last ounce of your strength and resolve to maintain an on-time flight schedule with aircraft mired axle deep in mud or a blown tire from frozen ruts or watched your few and precious passengers step in cow pies, you will know about drainage, hard surface runways, and airfields that are for airplanes and people, not cattle. And finally, if you have ever experienced the joy of parents greeting a well and happy child when only nights before the same child was near death, seen the dignity and courage of a senior citizen on his last ride, experienced the thrill and wonderment of a first airplane rider, young or old, then you will begin to understand how it was with us. Roy Franklin. Good job, good job, Mark. If I would have known when I came here, if I would have known when I came here in 1975 and uh, Roy offered me a job, he said, I'll pay you 500 bucks if you show up and work on the planes. So I said, okay. And uh, that, was, that was a great experience for me the whole time. And uh, I'll, I'll always remember Roy Franklin. Could you hold this for me for a minute? <laughs> Just hold that for me, okay? I got her. I got a few notes to go through here, but uh, I mentioned that Steve Franklin kind of drew a short straw and became the family presenter tonight, and he may Shanghai a few more of the family members up uh, later. We'll see how much wine they've had. <laughs> um, one of the interesting things in doing this is uh, when the Franklins finally said yes, they do it, they wanted to tell the story. And uh, part of that was they wanted to have a memorial or memorization of the story. So we're going to videotape it tonight. And uh, our, our member, Fred Shoemaker, is going to put it on uh, YouTube. So uh, if those have a desire to see it later, it'll, uh, it'll be up on YouTube. <clears throat> so Steve is our primary presenter. And Steve flew commercially uh, for his dad out of high school. Then uh, military service flying helicopters for the Army in Vietnam. After military service, he again worked with his dad until they sold the airline. Later, he joined Marilyn, uh, seated right here, then uh, Marilyn Labar, uh, Marilyn Naslin, and uh, Dan Weber as partner in aeronautical services, of which Steve finally became the uh, sole owner. Through aeronautical service, they briefly owned Harbor Airlines and West Isle Air uh, during the late 90s in an attempt to duplicate what the dad's old operation was. Currently, Steve owns aeronautical services and Catalina flying boats uh, and is a cargo operation flying caravans out of Long Beach, California, serving primarily Catalina Island. Steve, the program's yours. Do I need to hold this for you too? Yeah. <laughs> are you, are, are you okay? Maybe. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Hey, you got this? I think so. Right. I'll leave it there. Don't drop. All this paper, and you get that little piece. <laughs> yeah, I, I thought I was just going to sit up here and start talking, and then uh, I started trying to think of what I was going to talk about, and I realized I better write something down because. And initially, um, Susie called me up and uh, said that she talked to Bob Brunkow and said that, you know, Bob was wondering if one of the family members would stop by and address um, the association and um, talk a little bit about the early days of flying. Well, in my mind, I think I'm sitting around a round table with about 12 pilots talking about what we were doing. So I said, sure, I'll do that. And I was talking to Bob a little later. <clears throat> 
said, no, 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 this is the family Christmas deal. And so and they said, well, you've got a lot of people coming, like 75 or maybe more. And they said, you know, I think we'll put this on YouTube. <laughs> so anyway, if I stumble a little bit, you'll know, it's probably because I forgot how to talk for a second. But anyway, um, as I say, Susie let me know about this. And, uh, and when she brought the request up, I... It brought back a memory of a number of years ago when I was visiting Dad and uh, Dad and Mom. And uh, Dad was real quiet and he wasn't saying very much and he was a little grumpy. And I said, what, what's the matter with you? And he said, oh, he said, I, uh, I um, agreed to speak at a meeting <clears throat> about the early days of flying. He said, my memory's gotten so crummy. He says, I'll probably just screw it all up. <laughs> and I, so anyway, I was thinking about that today. And... Uh, <laughs> And, so I'll try not to screw it up. <laughs> you know, later uh, a thought came to me that uh, someday I was going to be as old as Dad, and that maybe there would be a, <clears throat> somebody in in at that time that would want me to actually stand up and, and talk about the old days and it appears that time has come. Mm -hmm. I have to tell you it came a lot sooner than I thought it would. <laughs> I'm not the first to say that. As I've gotten older uh, time seems to speed up and when I think of those early days it doesn't seem that long ago but when I do the math it's been a, a while. Dad and Mom sold the company in 1979 and uh, I was thinking the math, yeah, 40 years ago. That's really hard to believe. Time really, really travels fast. Uh, I've always taken real pride in being an island boy, and um, I've often told people that I was born on the island, or at least I was here since I was born. It's not really quite true. Dad and Mom <coughs> got off the old black ball ferry at uh, in 1948. Dad was 23 years old, Mom was 19, and I was two and a half months old. April 1st, April Fool's Day. <laughs> I don't think they ever thought about it. I thought about it when I was walking around the other night. My God, that was April Fool's Day. Yeah. <clears throat> What's that? Today's Friday the 13th. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> As I've gotten older, time seems to pass, but in the early days it didn't seem like that long ago, but it just really was. And I've always taken real pride in being an Isler, and like I say, and, and, um, and I, I just, mm, anyway, it just seems like it's been such a short time ago, and, and it's not. Dad was born in 1924 on a farm in Ferndale, Washington. They were pretty poor, but I think most of the farmers were poor back in those days. And those kids, and those people, just worked their tails off. Dad learned at a very early age that you get up in the morning and there's a job to done, you just stick your head down and you get the darn thing done. And it served him well over the years. After, after or when the war started, Dad got in and enlisted in the Navy and for, uh, Let's see, he listed in the Navy, anyway. And he got into the flight program and became a carrier pilot, flying fighters. During this time, in addition to earning his wings, he met and married Margaret Ann Skinner, M.A. for short. After the war, there was a lot of ex-military pilots looking for flying jobs, and about the only thing available was instruction, so Dad got instruction and got into the instructing, and, and he was working with Whatcom, or actually it was Washington Aviation out of Bellingham. While he was instructing, he ran into Bob Shane. Bob Shane was an orcas guy, and he was about Dad's age, a little bit older, but he had uh, started a, um, not a scheduled service out of the islands to Friday Harbor, uh, out of the islands to Bellingham, and he'd, he was all by himself for a seven day oper week operation. So he talked to dad about being a relief pilot. So <clears throat> from that point on, that's kind of where the story began. He accepted, of course, he went to the islands. He ended up in Friday Harbor as, um, as uh, the pilot for, with Bob ran out of East Sound. Dad was pretty much in the Friday Harbor area, but together they serviced the islands.
Bob Shane sold the company in 1950 after a couple of years to a Dr. Howarth. And Dr. Howarth changed the name from Orcas Island Air Service to Island Air, which we have an Island Air now with Jackie. But, um, <clears throat> and um, he, Howarth uh, didn't last very long, about a, a year, I guess. And then after that year, um, Cap Ferris, Cap and, it was uh, Howard, or it was uh, Cap and Virginia Ferris ended up buying the airline and they brought Dad along with it. So they were not going to do any of the flying, of course. Cap was a, was a pilot and he had the airstrip on, uh, on Orcas Island, but uh, he was a sea captain. He was gone most of the time. So Dad was basically the sole pilot. They had two little stints in Voyagers and a, and a, and a, a little car downtown to run into Bellingham. So Dad run that, ran that for a while, and in 1953, um, Cap and Virginia brought him in and said that they wanted to sell the airline to him. And so um, they made it work. Dad brought Pappy or Grandpa Roy Sr. on board, and they and, and together they tried to make it work. And, you know, and so for the next 30 years. Island Sky Parade, later to be named San Juan Airlines, would become the center of the Franklin world, and that's no lie. It, was, it seemed like every day it was all part of what we were doing. Dad and Mom, for sure, we hardly ever saw Dad, of course. He was flying, Mom was taking care of five kids at one time, so it was, it was quite a struggle. I'm going to play a video now, or we're going to play a video, and, there, and um, my brother Kenny put that together for Dad's memorial, and it does a very nice job of touching upon the highlights of those 30 years, but it also faces, puts faces to the many people uh, that were intimately involved in those years, pilots, mechanics, uh, etc., uh, that really made it all possible, and that's kind of the neat, neat part of this. I believe it. Mom and Dad did a lot of work, but there was a lot of people that had made it all happen, for sure. We'll get it going. When Dad was uh, in the service, uh, <clears throat> not only not only did he get his wings and become an officer, he met Margaret Ann Skinner, and um, and that was the wedding picture on the last one. I can't go back, but. This is all his Navy time, of course. Corsair. Dad never did make it to the Pacific. They were had his airplane loaded on the carrier, and the war ended. He wasn't happy at the time, but I think he appreciated it later on. Does he look young there, or what? <laughs> Mom looked pretty young herself, 19. Yeah, that's his iconic one. Okay, we're getting to the islands. There's a reef net gear on Lummi, off Lummi Island right there. We're getting to the airplane stuff too. If you were around that time, you would have heard that ferry boat pull the whistle and that thing wouldn't go into reverse. And, uh, and, and that was the old Vashon. Some of the early years with Dad. That's an interesting story. Um, <clears throat> that's a CB right there. And uh, Bob Shane was rather impulsive and uh, he ended up um, seeing this CB and he bought it. And the next thing you know, dad's flying a CB. Well, he had some seaplane experience, so um, they flew it for about a year, but it, it was slow and it didn't have much power and it was difficult to load. The hydraulics were problematic. And um, 
So it event didn't last very long. After a year, they, they got rid of it. But Dad really enjoyed it and had some nice adventures with uh, that CB. That's Mom coming down to the shipyard down there to give Daddy's lunch, and that's me helping her. That's interesting here, uh, about the same time that Dad and Bob got going with uh, the land plane service, there was uh, um, um, Bob Savage, or Bill Savage and Bob Savage, they were brothers and they were, they were starting a seaplane operation as well. It turned out that uh, Bob and uh, Dad worked real, uh, Bill and Dad primarily, worked real well together even though they were in competition, they were great friends and they hunted together and when they had bad weather they would they'd do stuff together. So they, they complemented each other. The big difference really, and I think probably the difference over the long haul, Bob uh, would stay hung in there till the 60s, but or Bill Savage did. And, uh, and they, but they never really made the grade and <clears throat> eventually left the island. And, but Dad was running a scheduled service. That meant that every day he ran that, that flight, whether or not there was passengers. And so people began to count on the fact that they could actually get over there. And of course, it didn't cost him very much. It was $5 or something like that from the islands to Belly and $4 from East Sound. So it was one of those deals that in my mind, that's probably why they were successful and the charter op operations eventually were not. And, you know. There they are right now. Bill's on the left, uh, Bob's on the right. Bob was a master mechanic, amazing man. Uh, Bill was a very good pilot. He was mechanic too, but that's kind of the team that they had at the time. It's supposed to be a Piper uh, family cruiser. Doc Keith used the seaplane and the land plane, but eventually pretty much switched over all to the land plane service. Yep, there's uh, Bill and his dad, and uh, feeding the family, <coughs> feeding the family is what it says at the bottom. And and really, in those days, it was really tough. And and these people, Bill, uh, Dad, everybody, I remember as a kid, Susie and I, we had rabbit freaking every night, it seemed like. <laughs> uh, it was an interesting story. Dad was flying Lyle King over to um, the island, and Lyle was bragging about, and this is in Dad's book, but bra bragging about how he got turkey for 39 cents a pound. And Dad was shocked. He says, why would you buy turkey for 39 cents a pound when you got 100 rabbits running out there? And, and <laughs> Lyle says, we don't eat them. <laughs> and so he went in and he told mom, he says, well, can you believe that? You free rabbits out there and they won't eat them. Man, there must be something wrong with them. He said about a year later, mom was cooking <clears throat> rabbit. Dad came out and said, I can't eat that stuff anymore. And, and mom said, I can't either. So dad took it out and gave it to the dog. He took one sniff and walked away. He couldn't eat it anymore. <laughs> but, the deer was a different thing, pheasant, that, duck, that, all that stuff we had a lot when we were kids growing up. It was just part of the deal. That car there is pretty interesting. That was the first limousine, sir, uh, and that's on Orcas Island, by the way, but that's the first limine, limousine that we had in Bellingham that ran from the airport down to the Leopold Hotel, picked up stuff. It, um, it had a few adventures too. Eventually they ended up getting a 1948 DeSoto or something like that and replaced it. Bob Shane. Not too many pictures of him, but he was quite a fella. He started it all. Waldron Island. Dad had a really special relationship with Waldron people and they depended on him totally. They had no, they had no telephone or any of that type of service. So. We would, um, Dad would, um, if there was important messages, they knew that they could get hold of us. Uh, Dad at Island Sky Prairie, he'd write up a little note, put it in a little rock with a streamer on it, take it out, find out. <clears throat> he knew everybody on the island there, so he'd go buzz the place until they came out and he'd drop it and the message would be complete. They also had, uh, of course, the, what they called the flag, and um, uh, as Dad would be making a run from the islands uh, through East Sound, he'd look over there, and if the flag was up, he'd go over and pick up a passenger or do whatever was work, worked pretty well. But the islanders depended on him, and he became very close to most of them. Chuck Ludwig was 
And Dad was landing on uh, Sandy Point there on Walder, and he often used Sandy Point even when uh, Middlestats had their airport done simply because of weather. Uh, if it was too wild at the airport, he could go out to Sandy Point and land out there. Chuck Ludwood was a, uh, an organic chemist, a chemist, worked in Bellingham for Georgia Pacific. And he lived to be 93 years old, and he traveled back and forth. We flew him all the time. And uh, he was one of the, anyway, he just didn't think that he fit with the island and the Waldron people, but he did. Taylor family, Point Disney behind there. These are all Waldron pictures. This is the, um, this is the strip that they finally, when they got off the beach, the <coughs> beach then they had Otto Middlestadt's uh, ranch that they'd land on. That was the east side of Waldron. It was one of those one-way strips. You'd land <coughs> east to west and there was no going around. It was heavy timber on the other end. So once you got down in the gap, you were, you were, that's where you were gonna stay. And a that's, um, uh, does it say? No, that's, uh, that gal right there is a Chevalier, well, is the aunt of uh, Franny Chevalier. Chevaliers, of course, have lots of property on Waldron. This is an interest story, interesting story, and I just wish I, could, I knew it better. Dad told me, of course, but I was just a kid, and, and I was sure it would be in the book, and it wasn't. But he landed on, uh, on uh, Sandy Point out there, and it was a low tide. And, um, and of course, once you drop the tail on that bushman, you can't see what you're doing very much, so you better be pretty sure what's out in front of him. And he tagged uh, a log or some darn thing and damaged the aircraft to the point where he couldn't fly it. Well, he's out there on, on the flats, and, and tide's coming in, and a storm was coming in, supposedly, too, and he was... He didn't know what to do. He thought he might lose the airplane. And he got a hold of the Ludwigs, I think it was the Ludwigs, and they got their old mule down there, hooked it on and drug it up into the woods. And you can still see the tying down on. They tied, it down, tied her down and, the, and the, um, the storm went by and he got some mechanic out there and got it fixed and got it off the, off the beach, but you can, <clears throat> only on Waldron. Two Stinsons. On Orcas Island, that's a little shack they had up at the, uh, uh, at the south end of the airport. It was there forever. Might still be there. Here's the Kingsfield. You've seen lots of pictures of it, but <clears throat> as Dad said, if you've been walking and been trying to fly an airplane with it up to the mud and axle, uh, up to the axles and mud and cow pies, you're going to want to have a hardtop runway at some point. That's pretty cool. <laughs> yeah, a little different way of starting an airplane, but we had to at that point. That was me running out of the way. Yeah. And there's mom and Susie, Janet, and Steve. There I am helping out a little bit. That was an interesting story too. I remember dad, one of the first times he really got after my hind end, I looked at the old tail on that and it just always fascinated me. I wanted, I looked like what, riding a horse. And so when dad wasn't looking, I leaped up there and sat down on that and, and he, he wasn't real happy and he told me he thought I knew better and I thought I didn't know any better obviously but I didn't get up on there anymore. Bob Fawcett, uh, that was the first pilot that dad had to help him. Up until that time he was doing everything seven days a week and um, he said in his book and he's told me as well that it was such a relief and it wasn't so much that he helped him out and he got time off. He had somebody to talk to. And, um, and should we go, should we shouldn't go, have somebody to kid around with, etc. That's mom and uh, Pauline, her sister. That's little Susie up in the, uh, <clears throat> in the front seat. She thinks she's gonna fly. 
Dr. Heath. Ah, this is good. That's Al Nash and Priscilla Nash. And that's their third child. Every one of those kids has had a flight on the airplane before they were more than three days old, I can guarantee you that. I don't know how many people that were, but I, I don't know anybody that I grew up with that didn't make that flight. Uh, I'm sure there were, but um, it just got to be the deal. And when it was time to have the baby, you got in the airplane, you flew over to St. Joe, and the next day or the day after, you, when you were released, you came back to the island. So anyway, there's Al and Priscilla on a third of, I think, six kids, maybe five. Dad got a stork award one time. I don't know where, I don't remember. I just remember him getting it. I think it was Christmas or something, but a lot of the gals on the island that had had children that flew back and forth that got together and did a, Susie might remember it better than I, but anyway, they gave him the stork award. Now, this is kind of an interesting picture here. Uh, that's the, the, the storm. That was the early 50s. Uh, again, Dad probably was all mostly by himself then, and, and honestly, he, and the, the book points it out, that um, he, he just didn't know how much more he could do it. He wasn't getting ahead, uh, barely making enough to live on, <clears throat> uh, flying seven days a week, medical flights in the night, flying all day, and then <clears throat> had this big storm. This faced to the west, and it was a, like a willy -wot went through. It was very, very strong and, and unusual and fortunately had the tie, plane tied down, but it just destroyed the hangar and um, uh, minimal damage to the airplane, unbelievably. So the next day he's out there combing through the wreckage uh, with a magnet trying to pick up some valuable uh, nuts and bolts that he needed to, to, for maintenance. And, um, and Doc Heath and Roy Gressley came down and uh, with a number of other guys and they, he said he was sitting there, he didn't know what was going on, they were just kind of looking at him. And he, and he says, what? And he's, they, they said, looks like you had a problem here. We're gonna give you a hand. So they, they went out there and started hauling all that stuff back in. And, and, and two days later, he had his hanger back. And it just, he, he had gone to the point where he just thought he was gonna give up. And it was, um, and it just gave him a shot of adrenaline. And he knew that people actually cared. And, um, up until that time, he wasn't that sure, I don't think. And so, uh, it kept him going a couple more years anyway. <laughs> Susie and Dad. That's the only day I remember in those days that Dad took a day off. Uh, I don't know exactly what the deal was, but they, he, um, he got somebody to fly for him for a day, and he came in and he started working on the car. Susie and I were helping him, so he got it done, I suppose. But it, <clears throat> he said it was, it was just like, um, I don't know, just like it regenerated him, giving him just that one day. But we helped him, of course. It's Janet and Nancy and Mom. Same. This is just a little bit of an interesting story. His brothers, the two men on either side, um, Glenn and Dale, they both in the service were in Europe. Um, I think it was Dale first, but anyway, he went in and uh, he'd, picked, he'd got, gotten a girlfriend, uh, she was Scottish, and um, uh, they, be, they got married, and came back to the sta States, and a year or so later, Glenn was over there, thought he'd go in and visit, and there was another daughter there, so he married her, so it was two brothers and two daughters, and it worked out very well. Yeah. Up on the upper end, you can see that spring tree, and then that's the driveway that comes down to the airport. They've cleared most of the trees through here. Dad said it was really a, a boon, the fact that um, Roach Harbor was still buying timber at, uh, I think it was, I don't know what it was, 10 bucks a quart or something like that. Anyway, there was no, he said there was no stumpage, and so uh, Roach came out, and I don't know how many cords they took out of the deal. Maybe it was the 1,600 cords, but they, it was able to clear most of the, the trees in that area without having to cut them himself. Now this is a story. This is a, this is we called him Pappy, but he, he's Dad's dad, and we initially called him, you know, Roy. But the, he 
he came out and he, I think he worked 10 years straight with Dad, and he's an old farmer. He's in his 70s right now, and that bar he's got is over 30 pounds. It's a steel bar. He drives it underneath the, the stumps, then get down to the center, and then he, he'll put in about six di sticks of dynamite, blow that stump, and then old Fred Sunstrom with his tractor would come out and dig that stump out, put it in a pile, and he could burn it. Uh, if you just pulled the stump out with all the dirt and stuff that it collected on it, it wouldn't burn well. Anyway, 1,400 stumps, and Pappy Friggin did most of them. Look at that guy, 70-some years old with that big old bar. You're going to see plenty of Pappy as we go forward. And there's one blowing up. Yeah, he got so used to the name, he started calling himself Pappy after a while. There's a ramp out there. I, I looked for it here a couple years ago. I couldn't find it, but uh, Grant poured it, and he poured all the cement ramps by hand. And um, he was a hard-working dude. But anyway, he, it, it, this was when he'd gotten pretty used to the word, everybody calling him Pappy, and it started with one of the pap pilots calling him that. And pretty soon Dad was calling him Pappy, and everybody was. I still called him Grant, but everybody else called him Pappy. Anyway, he poured the ramp. And he had it down in there, um, I put in his name on it, it says, this here ramp was poured by Pappy in 1958. <laughs> so it, it's out there someplace if it hasn't worn out. There's Fred Sundstrom there. That's the entrance coming down to the airport. And if you look over uh, <clears throat> to the east there, there's a mountain you don't see there anymore. That's Bald Mountain and that's in Canada right now. <laughs> gravel pit. There's our first terminal area. You see the gals sitting out there waiting in the sunshine? I don't know what they did in the winter time. A couple guys hanging out and gabbing. Grandpa would, that was his first house. Initially he slept on a cot in the entranceway to our house and then he moved out to this little trailer which we used as a greeting area for passengers and he slept there at night. And then finally when dad built a little terminal, we had a little room in the back with a shower and a in his own bathroom and that, and it worked out much better, but. You can, you can see the foundation for that terminal, and there's the old terminal right there. Those uh, trees that you see there, Dad spent a whole winter uh, peeling those, cutting those trees down and peeling them because he thought he'd build a pole building. Uh, it turned out that um, uh, Charlie Carlisle, the old guy that, um, uh, was the uh, builder for the, uh, the terminal, said that uh, it cost more money to do it with those poles than it would by building it uh, conventionally. So Dad reluctantly said, well, okay, if that sound will do it conventionally. Later he found out that Charlie just didn't want to deal with his tolls. He was kind of, kind of getting kind of old and he didn't want to have to be packing those things around. So he ended up selling them to, uh, I think it was just, uh, Inglesby. Uh, for seven bucks a piece, so he ended up with a thousand dollars worth of uh, revenue for the winter he took doing those poles. He was happy with that. There's old Pappy again going for it. That's Charlie Carlisle. The terminal coming to be. That's how he did it by hand. Those are, that's one of the ramp. Might, that might have been the one that has his name on it. He's probably close to 80 by now. That's old 20 kilo. That was the first uh, Stinson we had. I really liked the red. I never did like the yellow too much. There you can see the beginnings of the cross strip um, that we had running east to west. The Wester's lease just killed us, and so um, Dad put that cross strip in. We'd never take it, use it for takeoff, but we'd come in and land on it. You can see there's no terminal at that particular point in time. Just a hangar. First comes first. <laughs> I don't know how many in the old days went and landed on that Shaw Strip, but that was, that was quite an adventure. It was uphill landing one way with high ground <clears throat> to the north. You, there's no go around on the thing. But the, the real trick was you got to get on the ground early because this was a county road that ran across the center of it right there. And on top of that, it had high tension wires above that. So you had to go under the wires and up the hill to stop flip it around, keep your people and come down and keep it on the ground and you didn't want to get off early and at the bottom you'd 
you depart. So it was that way for a long time. It's, the strip really hasn't changed that much even to this day, except that it still has the road go across it, but has stop signs now, and, uh, and the, no more wires. That was the first strip on, um, on uh, Shaw. It was Ellis Weeks had a strip over there, but he eventually closed it down. Crane Island, short little strip. That's a approach on the cross strip right there. You can, again, you can see the, uh, it's starting to go away, but there's the hill on the backside. We used to call it Bald Mountain. It was a great place to park when I was in school. <laughs> they, took, they took it away. Now we had to find someplace else. This is an interesting picture. That's Wayne Fowler right there in his little Aronka. And you might notice the, um, underneath the strut, that piping that he's got running to the back of the tail that's latched to the tail wheel and up onto the other side. Uh, Wayne was pretty innovative and I'm sure he was in construction so I'm sure he needed a part on Shaw so that's how he hauled it over there. <laughs> Wouldn't fly today. Yeah, Kenny pointed out that Susie didn't have any shoes on this one for some reason or other. Susie, Janet, Kenny, Nancy. What was the deal on that, Sue? <laughs> That's all of us together. Ken. Ernie Gann had uh, bought a little stunt plane uh, for Myra Slovak, who was a uh, Booker Youngman. Yeah, it was a beautiful little airplane. Kenny and Ernie got along great. I don't know, uh, 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 anyway, uh, I don't know if Ken got to fly in it. Uh, I think he did, but he got to take it his, got to get his picture taken in it anyway. One of the few things Dad was able to do is Bill Huckins came to the island. He's a professional diver and became friends with Dad and talked Dad into trying the, the scuba driving stuff out, so he did. And uh, back in, I remember him staying up till midnight, gluing this stuff together, because all they did was give you neoprene, uh, neoprene and, uh, and, uh, and a, a form to, to cut it and then put it together. So we, Dad and I would sit up there, he a lot later than me, and we'd <clears throat> sit there and glue those together. Marilyn would be happy to be, can recognize this is a Minnesota Reef. That's where we'd go out there, the dad and I, and, and uh, Marilyn's got a house right out there. You can see Kenny in the background with his usual pose. He's always peed off because dad gets to do stuff with, Ken, with Steve and Kenny doesn't, has to stay with the girls all the time. <laughs> That's what he says. He put this together. Steve always gets to go with dad. Yeah, once the kids got old enough that mom didn't have to be babysitting them all the time, she was out at the airport. She did the books, she did dispatching, which was not easy, and, and she did a great job. They were the team, no question. Bellingham Bay. I don't see anything in it. It might have been a, <clears throat> Dad might have been in the mountains. There's uh, Orcas, Parker Reef. Oh, I was gonna show, you might have noticed the tail number was 04B. I think somebody on the island has 04B still. That was uh, the second uh, 172 Dad bought when he started moving from Stinson's into the Cessnas. This was actually staged uh, for something. I don't remember what it was. You'll notice the guy on the stretcher is Terry Holt. He's one of our passengers. <laughs> you got Gene Carter on the end there, Dr. Heath, George Ward, who was our mechanic dad on one end. And there's my old uncle, Uncle Fred from Bellingham. He used to run the tra freight for us over there.
Dad could have written a book about dropping in the mountains, I'm telling you. Um, I don't know why the chapters aren't more in, involved with that, but he did it for 25 years. I remember going to Bellingham uh, again as a kid. I don't remember every detail about it, but um, uh, they would have an air show every year, and <clears throat> if Dad was between flights or whatever, he'd, uh, and apparently I was with him on this particular time, but one of the cool things they do, and maybe they do some of these air shows, the pilots would go up and they'd have a couple, three sacks of uh, flour, and the competition was to hit a mark on the ground from 800 feet or whatever it was. And, um, and so each airplane would have its turn, they'd go over and they'd drop their sack of flour. Dad killed him. He, he just, he'd done so much of that. Um, I don't know if you've ever tried to drop something out of an airplane and hit a splint on the ground. It's not really easy, even when it's uh, not weighted. Start putting parachutes on it when you start getting wind drift and things like that, then it starts getting really complicated. You go up into the mountains where there's smoke and invisibility is low and there's mountain and rough terrain and these guys are on the side of a hill someplace on either side of cliff or high ground, low ground, high ground, steep ground. If you don't hit the spot, they lose what they're doing. These are people that are up in the mountains fighting their fires and they recount on the drops for their food and their supply. There was a lot of pressure to hit the spot. Dad got good at it after a while, for sure. Yeah, there's an example there. Of the, Dad said they say they had to make their own chutes if they were burlap, but after the uh, war they started getting uh, surplus nylon chutes. He said there was quite a difference in dropping them. The burlap opened real quick, so it had opened up and drift down, and you had to take into account that these the silk suits chutes would um, open later. And so there was again there was a lot of a lot of skill. Ernie again. Dad and Ernie should not have been friends. <laughs> they, and they were, I don't know how it worked. They were both A-type personalities and they fought all the time. And Ernie flew, came out and they, he wanted to fly for Dad and he just moved up to the island. He wanted to fly for a summer so he could meet the people and kind of get acquainted. And Dad didn't want to do it. And, uh, but Ernie was persistent so finally they went ahead and made an agreement and Ernie did fly the summer. And there were some battles in there for sure. But at the end of the day, they respected each other, I believe, and, and they ended up being very good friends. Ernie didn't work past that time of the summer, but they became good friends. <laughs> Bob Nichols and Ernie. Yeah, when Ernie uh, wrote his, I think it might have been one of his last books, but in the Company of Eagles, they, he gave Dad a copy, of course. Bill Booze and Dad. Bill Booze and, and Bob Nichols. Bob Nichols on the left, Bill Booze on the right, Dad in the middle. They were both within a year, all three of them within a year or two, all of them ex-vets. Bob was, was in a tank. I don't know, remember what Bill did. And, I, I, and Dad, of course, was in the aviation part of it. But three excellent pilots, three great personalities and people that never quit. We were summertime there working 12, 14 hours a day, seven days a week, and nobody, I don't remember anybody complaining. They just, they really were the backbone, as Kenny's put in here. They were the A team for sure, and they were together for probably almost 10 years. This was a situation where um, the post office um, Built, they built a new post office, and there was quite the to do about the whole thing. It was uh, in those days you'd go up to Marbles Hardware, and, uh, and and that's where the post office was. And just they just ran out of room, so they decided to build a post office, and they did. But there was a big blow up with the Marbles. You, it's a whole nother story, but it was a big deal. And uh, you see, there's Dad there, and next to him on his left is um, Herb Cranick, and he had the tavern downtown. He was a pilot. Um, and on the far left is Jim Brown. He was the mayor at the time. Dad had bought a brand new airplane. It was a Lockheed Electra. And he bought it for the 63 World Fair. This would be about 62 here. And um, the airplane never really turned out. Uh, we didn't generate the traffic we thought we were going to do. And it was sold shortly after the world uh, that year. But uh, it was... Uh, the first time we'd stepped up to a twin-engine, ten-place airplane, and, uh, and it was a big deal for us. And 
this uh, was an opportunity. They flew it down to Seattle to pick up the dignitaries in Seattle to come up and dedicate the, uh, the, uh, the post office. So it was a great opportunity for advertising and, and et cetera for us. You'll see a picture of the airplane itself. There was quite the story of it coming back up to it had a huge windstorm and had problems, but that's the airplane right there. So they went in and dedicated the whole thing and then they came back out and <clears throat> had a big party out at the airport and uh, flew them back home. It was a heck of an airplane. Very similar to Twin Beach, a little bit bigger, a little more power. Air commuters. In the uh, late 60s, all of the uh, little air taxi operations in the islands and through Puget Sound, really, were doing very well. And, uh, every, and it was a boom time for the economy. And so um, when we were all flying passengers in Seattle, but we had no place to go. I remember being out in Sea Concourse, I'd go out there and pick a clear out at the end of Sea Concourse. You'd have to pack all everybody's baggage out there. The thing must be a half a mile out to the end. And of course, we'd be right at the end, meet the people in the main terminal, and then we'd have to drag everybody out there. Uh, when you'd land, they'd give you a pot spot on the airplane to park. You didn't know where that was going to be until they put you there. And then, you know, where do you greet people when they come in? Well, you meet me in, you know, at such and such a place, and you'd link up with them, and people would get lost. And it was just a mess. Um, Wes Lupian, one of the six operators in the uh, Puget Sound area, a good friend of Dad's, he, um, he thought, well, why don't we together go together and, and go to the port and try and get a local spot for the commuters? Uh, the port actually was pretty happy with it because they didn't like a, half a dozen of us running all over the place either. So it was consolidation. Once we did that, then they saw we felt that was going so well that they decided that why don't we just join together, form a separate airline that has all of us, and um, and we could operate together. Uh, and they tried that, didn't work out. About 18 months later, it failed. After that fiasco, they called it Puget Sound Airlines. Um, Dad and West Lupian um, still had lots of traffic. They just didn't have any airplanes anymore because it was sent into receivership. So they started back up and they were able to bootstrap themselves up and get going again and eventually got into the Islanders, which turned out to be very good airplanes for making money. It wasn't so great for passengers, little bench seats in them, hardly any view, noisier and heck slow. Uh, but fixed gear and um, uh, light combing engines and, and uh, the, uh, those, those engines were put in real tight to the, air, uh, to the fuselage so you lose an en engine, you didn't have the torque problems is what, what you would with more, most twins. Terry Holt was taken off of Seattle right off the off. he lost the left engine with a full load of people, full gross, chugged around land like it was nothing on the other end. That's, that's what you want in a twin engine airplane. Bill, um, well that's Denny Martell, and then uh, Oral Weaver, and then uh, Billy Booz. Or pa Dick Palmer, L. Odell. This is an interesting guy, Tony Paul. Good friend of Dad's, he and his brother Walt Paul started a operation up into, um, uh, I think it was out of Seattle, it was certainly down south operating and I don't remember, uh, I tried to look it up, I can't find it anywhere, but Dad was saying they were running a flying boat, I'm assuming maybe a, a Grumman Goose or something of that nature. And uh, uh, so they actually started an operation coming up to the islands, it just didn't last very well. Tony ended up flying our little seaplane when we had a, a seaplane base for a short period of time. He was a good friend of Dad's. Yeah. Um, I just gotten out of the service. I like those flight jackets so much I stole about six of them before I left. <laughs> Kenny, going through the process. I believe um, uh, this is he's flying at this particular point in time, but that's where he and I both started. That was the first thing we do. We got out there at daybreak and headed for Anacortes with the uh, Bushman and brought the mail back and belt her time up. That's Ed Weed. 
Dan Weber, Tommy Clark from Shaw. Tom Sedlicus, had a mechanic. He was one of a very, very good mechanic for us for a number of years. Terry Holt and Dad. Terry still lives on the island, and his wife works for us in aeronautical services. Glenn and Pappy. That's the three brothers. I don't know what Dad's trying to imitate there, but uh, you got. Uh, Got Dale and Dad and Glenn. <laughs> Just like he's being goofy. Gary Warnock. Not many probably remember him, but started off as a ramper in, uh, Bel in Seattle for us, and then he came up and ended up being a dispatcher for us up there. Great guy. He's hung in there forever. Suzanne Franklin, Kenny's wife. That's me being busy again. Rich Herman, six foot five, about two twenty. Dad loved the hell out of the heck out of these, the way he flew, but he said he was just too big. I couldn't put him in an airplane and then put passengers in too, because I'd be overgrossed. So that was when we had the 172s with a well, were they 150s at that time, 160s maybe, but we ended up with, uh, Dad put Lycoming 180s with a uh, variable pitch prop on there, went right out and hired old Rich to come back because now he could fly and still put something in the airplane. Great pilot. Bob, uh, John Hurd. Mitch Meany. Susie, do you remember who that is? I, I know him like I back of my head, but I can't think of his name. Okay, I'll go on. I don't know that guy either. There's somebody I know. Les Labar. I, I kind of got out of aviation for a few years, and then uh, the twin boys came along, and I had to go back to work. And, I'm not, and Dad, we didn't have the airline anymore. And so uh, I came back up into Friday Harbor, and I ran into Dan Weber and uh, Les, and Marilyn had aeronautical services. Les had flown for us for a year or so, I guess, and then uh, he kind of branched off on his own. He picked up this UPS contract, he and Maryland did, and, um, and you know, initially they weren't flying anything out there, but they were flying a few and were making a few dollars, and, and, uh, and it worked. And uh, so when I came on board, or I came back, uh, and of course these were friends of mine, Dan particularly, and, and um, so, at, Long story short, I ended, they ended up making me a partner with them. Probably the most fortunate thing that's happened, one of the most fortunate things that's happened to I'm totally grateful for it. I'm still involved with aeronautical services. Great guy. This is Everett Johnson. What you see is everything he is. I, oh, sorry, I missed that. Sorry, I, I can't go back on it. Anyway, that's, um, that's Hank Brown. There's Nick. There's um, uh, Mike Nash, and uh, he flew for us for a couple summers. Mike was a good pilot, great guy. Ed Ed Weed, and uh, there's Gary Warnock again. I can't remember this gentleman either, but his face is really familiar. <laughs> the uh, gas boy up there. He came in. He was a high school kid. He had hair down to his but he had red hair and he was a goofy guy and I told dad, no, you don't need to hire that guy. Dad said, well, I don't know, he's a nice kid. So he hired him and um, Todd Henyon was his name. And within a month or so, he had his hair shaved off. He was taking flight lessons. He was working like a dog out there. Ended up flying for us for a couple years, ended up going to Horizon, and he retired to Horizon after 29 years as the chief pilot in the main industry. <laughs> so just tell you, these pilots come from everywhere. You can't know where they're coming from. Did a great job. There's some people from me sound. That's Skip Lean, and uh, that's Chuck Doney. That's the mechanic, I can't remember his name. That's uh, one of the mechanics. George Ward became a good friend of dad. This guy would work night and day, 24 hours a day. I never saw a guy that could work like that and I'm just a master mechanic. He was also the biggest BSer you ever saw in your entire life. <laughs> Anybody who knows George knows that. 
Janet, she's doing the books. I think, I'm not sure who that is. There's Suzanne and Holly. There's the twins coming. <laughs> There's um, uh, Weber, Dan Weber, Susan Williams, and Suzanne. Oh, there's a good one for Susie right there, and Steve Hudson, Mom, and Suzanne, and little Matt, Matt Hudson. That's the extension that we put on the, uh, uh, the uh, terminal. There's old Frank Gard, he did it, and of course Frank was the guy that was working with us on that airstrip uh, for the first 10 years. Good friend of Dad's, good friend of all of ours. The Wamplers, Susie Wampler's still on the island. Herb Cranick again. There's old Mac McGarry. Mac McGarry was, ran the Riptide forever, which is now Haley's, and, uh, and ended up being one of the constables. He chased me down a couple times when I was in high school. <laughs> Bob and Rod Erickson. Rod was a good pilot, and uh, he built Friday Harbor West, which is no longer on the island there, but it's out there where the, um, I can't remember what they call that area out there now, but uh, towards the valley. And then Rod <coughs> built the uh, Oaks, uh, out there with uh, all the, the uh, traders. That's Nordine Jensen and, and uh, George Ward, and they were great buddies. Nordine's, of course, an iconic figure on the island. This is during PSA times, they were convinced they were going to get twin otters, and Dad uh, was checking one out. This is retirement. His last flight, Kenny and Bob, Dad, myself and Mom, were getting ready for the party. We're still partying. <laughs> you can see it's almost over for the party for me, I think. <laughs> yeah. I don't know if you know this, many know the story of that prop right there. I think it's in the terminal now. On, I'm not sure I heard it was. I was going to read you the story about that. I don't know, do we want to do that, you think? It's a couple. Because I can't duplicate it. I can tell you what it is. But Dad was, um, Dad was probably in the first year or so of uh, flying out in the islands. He was with Bob Shane at the time, or Bob Shane and he were flying at the time. This is a couple pages long, but I, I can't possibly describe to you in words how this all transpired, but it's probably, I, I don't even know how he survived this thing, and I wouldn't be reading it right now, except it ended up fairly humorous. But uh, <clears throat> he said he dropped old Elmer off at, and departed Waldron for Friday Harbor while approaching the east ends of Shaw. The, island at 800 feet. Suddenly a violent shaking hit the front end of the airplane. Smoke boiled out of the engine area and part of the engine cowl came loose and flew back against the windshield, shaking so violently that my vision was blurred. It was as though the whole engine had blown up. I immediately shut down the engine. When the propeller came to a stop, the shaking stopped and there sticking up in the air looking at me was the jagged broken end of the propeller. Yellow Island and Crane Island were the only fir firma, <coughs> only Tierra firma reachables, no beaches, no farm fields, all were woods and water. Would have to be a water ditching. This lovely new airplane was probably on its last flight. The narrow pass between Crane Island and Orcas Island called Pole Pass looked like probably my best bet. There I would have a better chance of swimming to Orcas, and <coughs> which is an inhabited shore, and perhaps later I would have a chance to salvage the air airplane. Thank God I had no passengers on board. A 10 to 12 knot southwesterly wind was blowing. I was immediately turned and I was now gliding downward, losing altitude rapidly. It was obvious it was going to take all my altitude to reach the pass. I would have no altitude left or room to turn back into the wind. That was not good, and that was not good. I had no illusions to the outcome. With no shoulder harness or helmet, with a non-retractable landing gear and traveling downwind fast, the plane would hit hard flip on its back and sink, me too if I was unconscious. No radio, no boats, nothing visible. Now I'm entering the narrow gut of the pass, big fir trees on either side, crane on my left, orcas on my right. I left a flash view of a house in a small clearing on Crane Island. 
Ooh, instinctively, I turned towards it instantly, but too late. I realized I had made a potentially fatal error. I've trapped myself in a notch on a little cove with no power and no room. There was no way out. To keep from ramming the cove sidewall, I momentarily, in a wild vertical bank to the left, I was momentarily in a wild vertical bank to the left and sinking fast with the wind as it spills over the island. In my face, like a massive picket fence, a line of tall fir trees stand between me and the clearing. I'm below their level. I, I can't make it. Bam! I hit the trees. There would be many times in the future when I would ponder over those next few seconds. Could it be possible that the good Lord figured I was worth saving? After all, he knew if he interceded now and then he would get probably 30 years worth of flying midnight medical flights out of, out of the islands from, from me. Something like that must have happened because what happened next had absolutely no, nothing to do with pilot skill. The plane in a vertical bank slammed through the cross, <coughs> solid cross hatches of limbs without touching the trunks of the trees. Covered with limbs and out of flying speed, the plane stalled and rolled to the right in what used to be called an over-the-top stall, unbelievably hitting the steep upslope squarely on both main wheels. The impact would have collapsed most landing gears, although the stints and tires, tires were smashed flat, jamming dirt and grass between the tires and up into the wheels. The gear held. The plane made a, plane made a spine-snapping bounce. The rising ground came up to catch it. Instinctively, I slammed on the brakes, the plane and I slid to a stop within four feet of a fenced garden by the side of a small cottage. Slowly, I became aware of being still alive. And about that same time, I became aware of a woman just 10 feet from the nose of the airplane. Her back was turned and she was bending over thinning carrots. <laughs> With the combination of her bad hearing, no engine noise and the wind blowing, she was completely unaware of my presence. <laughs> Ever since the realization had seared into my mind that I had made a fatal mistake by turning my powerless plane into this dead-end cove, I had been functioning in what might be called as a numbed robot state. When I crawled out of the airplanes, my legs would not hold me. I was glad the lady still had not seen me. <laughs> Frankly, it took several tries before I could even speak. When she did hear me, my unexpected voice so close to her, it really gave her a start. Nothing, however, compared to her, nothing, however, compared to her speechless, open mouth reaction when she turned and looked into the front of the airplane. <laughs> you can imagine, it'd be like an apparition or something, I suppose. Anyway, I don't know which of us, she or I, was in worse shape. Like me, it took her a while to find her voice. Uh, who, who, how? It, I, I, I go, I, I need to use your t t telephone, ma'am. <laughs> Probably if things had been more normal, this lady might have said, Sonny, you might need a bathroom first. <laughs> I finally got through to her, and she turned and made me to understand the closest telephone was on the other side of the pass on Orcas. Never taking her eyes off my airplane, she slowly mumbled, you can use the rowboat. Well, Dad got over to the other island, got the mechanic people over, and, and within a week or two, he was able to fly that back out. It was only 100, 400 foot from the woods to the edge of the um, uh, embankment. They allowed her, they, she let him, allowed him to cut a couple trees. He got a flat pitch prop from Bob, or Bill Savage, and, um, and he got out. Yeah. You don't get too many of those. That's an interesting picture there. I, I really, I have only seen this. There's probably others, but you can see Dad's <coughs> airstrip in there. And of course, they didn't want to shut the operation down, so they had to build a new airport without doing so. And they put it in a slight angle. And, uh, and started south of, uh, of the airport. And you can see the taxiway is pretty much done. Uh, and the main runway is still just to be finished, but it worked out really well. We're almost done here, folks. Pappy and Dad back at the old farm in uh, Mount Vernon. Or not Mount Vernon, Ferndale. 
Dad's in, Pappy's been in his 90s at that point. That's uh, Suzanne's dad and mom, Charlton, who is a VIP for Boeing, or a VP for Boeing. Well, there's Mark and Jamin. Yep, Dr. Heath and uh, Evelyn. She was British, so we didn't call her Evelyn, it was Evelyn. And um, I don't think there was a man in the world Dad respected more than Doc Heath. These guys <clears throat> spent a lot of nights flying people back and forth, and every time Dad thought that he just couldn't do it anymore, he said, God, what is Doc Heath gonna do? And he admired him so much, Doc Heath, seven days a week, Day, night and day, and uh, anyway, the respect was to dad too. They had a special relationship for sure. Great man. Yeah, this was kind of after dad had retired. Ernie talked him into taking a parachute jump with Joan uh, La uh, Lawrence, I think her name was, out at Kenny's place. He only did it once. <laughs> he, Kenny was an accomplished <clears throat> jump pilot and, and he was doing some work with Falcons trying to see how fast they would fly, etc. And that required him bailing out of an airplane. So Dad did the flying and they filmed it for National Geographic. It was pretty successful. Ended up timing that Falcon at 209 miles an hour and setting the world's record for speed for an animal. <clears throat> Mom retired. Remember those young guys who were working with Dad? That's Bob and Terry Holt. Dad with the cane, so <laughs> times change. Yeah, this was a dedication to the terminal to Dad. He was in, getting in tough shape for getting around in those days. Susie wanted the wagon, I wouldn't give it to her. The old timers used to tilt their hats like that all the time, remember? Rough start, but it got <laughs> Thank you.